Welcome to Mundy. My mama says bad words. Thanks for listening. See you next time. I, I did it. Good job. Finding the right jeans is hard. Accepting your jeans is even harder. Whether you wear boyfriend or boot cut, high rise or low rise, this podcast will teach you to love the jeans you are in. I'm Rachel. And I'm Tina. And we're going to use modern research to bust diet myths and get real about body after baby. We're going to take you on a journey of unpacking your old beliefs about food and weight so you can learn to nourish your body and raise body confident kids. So put your booty in a chair and let's talk mom jeans. Welcome to season four of Mom Jeans. This season is called the Bite Size Education Series, where we give you quick bits of science and psychoeducation to help you in your journey towards body respect. This season, we will be answering your listener questions and interviewing amazing experts to expand your knowledge. So get ready for easily digestible, mm, pun intended, pieces of education in podcast form. Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of Mom Jeans. You are listening to our Bite Size Education series. Today, we are chatting about sugar. 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 That's all I can sing. That's all I can sing. Don't you dare. Don't. Sugar, sugar. No. (laughs) This is such a hot topic. We've actually done whole episodes on this back in previous seasons, especially in season three, the Mythbuster series. So, Go back to that for a deeper dive, but we are answering listener questions this series, and so we did get a question about sugar, and for parents, and also for raising children, this is definitely a topic that comes up over and over and over, so we're going to address it one more time this season. Yes. Do you want to share the listener question? I'll do it. All right. Dear Mom Jeans, my kid came home with a handout that says, quote unquote, sugar is bad. And I kind of believe it. I think the sugar in foods does impact people's health and body size. So I don't believe that limiting it and teaching how much hidden sugar is in items is harmful. But I don't want my child to become obsessed or develop an eating disorder. So what do I do? Love, sugar data. Aww, I hear you. And it's really confusing. And like Rachel said, we have done many episodes about, or not many, we've done some episodes. It's all a blur of what we've been talking about, but we've done episodes that really dives into the science of sugar and carbohydrates. And so I really feel like it would be wasted time if we're reviewing that and a disservice to this dad if we don't address his question through the angle of the sugar relationship. So today, Rachel and I are going to talk about the relationship that we all hold with sugar and or could be developing in a more neutral way. So I only have a two and a half year old, but Rachel, have your kids come home with assignments that say sugar is bad or they categorize food in ways that demonize sugar? Yeah, I mean, my preschooler, I'll never forget when he got in the car and said, Mommy, why did you give me strawberries in my lunch? And I said, because, I don't know, <laughs> I just did. Oh, because my teacher says strawberries have sugar and sugar's bad. You're really, you are really good at mimicking him because that's exactly you, how he said. You can't say his awe, sweet boy. So I emailed the teacher lovingly and we had a great chat about it. Um, but that is kind of the conversations that are happening. And I to this listener question about the hidden sugars i think that's the biggest like poster that i see in the doctor office like how many sugar in coke how much sugar in iced tea how much sugar in these drinks i think that is kind of the biggest conversation that my children are hearing is just like the sugar is this like i don't know little evil hidden thing inside the foods and you have to fear it because you never know So I I think talking about the relationship with it today is really helpful because I think that, like I said, that fear impacts how we view sugar and then therefore 
just our relationship with the food in general. Right. One thing you hit on that I don't want to graze over before we move on is you lovingly emailed your kid's teacher. And so I really believe in the concept of calling in versus calling out. And so the difference is going to be you reaching out and saying, hey, I'm curious on this information that was provided. I would love to provide my thoughts on that. Would you be interested in hearing that? And a lot, I mean, most of the time these teachers are like, oh my gosh, you're totally right. Um, they can totally opt out of that assignment or I'm going to talk to the, the board, the school board, the principal, whatever it may be, and get this assignment shifted. A lot of times they're just regurgitating information that was developed for them. And so I, I really don't want to call people out and, and, and shame and harm because then at that point we're not really teaching anybody anything and no one's changing and then we're just spinning in the same cycle of well now we just yelled at them and they're not actually helping our children make change so I really believe in just teaching people calling people in uh, addressing it in the most you know neutral compassionate way possible because really our teachers out there we appreciate y'all so much and we know how hard it is and how hard everyone works um, so we we really appreciate your work so anyways just throwing that out there so we are going to look at the two different pieces to the listener question today one is how do I handle this for my kids and the second is how do I handle this for myself um, so we're just going to go into the kids one for now since we're chatting about that. I think the the biggest question line that we get is how to introduce sugar to your children. Um, the feeling that comes over a parent when you watch your kid consume the sugar and get really excited and run laps around the table at the birthday party. <laughs> um, I think it can be kind of overwhelming for a parent to be like, I know when I give my child this food item things happen to their little bodies and spirits and that is scary again this is now going to the parents that's scary to be because i don't want them to like love it that much and like be obsessed about it and like want it because i i'm scared of what happens to people when they consume sugar so i think as a parent it's really hard to handle this calmly when you have your own fears so we'll go into that in a second but for so many kids sugar is just the foods that taste certain ways the foods that taste kind of more fun and so they get excited I mean I don't know about you but come on I'd rather eat a cookie yeah, than they get way more excited spinach. about candy at the movie yeah. theater than about the movie itself and so you know what it is what it is yes and that's I think a joyous part of food it's not just nutrition it's also um, delicious <laughs> and it's also connection and it's also um, fun and so I think all of those really great elements are a gift that our children are receiving when they are enjoying the sugar um, but Tina do you get questions about like how to have introduced children to sugar how to manage sugar to children from the nutrition lens the whole all the time I mean so if we think about it like kids under one their main nutrition is going to be some form of milk, whether that be breast milk, formula, you know, that is really their main source of nutrition. So food before one is just for fun. Food after one, okay, there you go, you know. So one way to do that is like, let's say, you know, you're introducing food to your kids at six months old, you offer milk first and then food as play. So would I recommend offering massive amounts of cookies and cakes and things like that to a six to one, six month to one year old? No, we're we're really just developing um, experimentation. You're developing skills. They're learning how it feels in their mouth. And their bodies are still drastically growing and developing and, and they are going to have a significant reaction. So it's the same thing with salt and that their kidneys can't really process high amounts of salt um, before one years old. So if we're talking about itty bitties, you know, really be mindful of that. After that, again, we come back to the division of responsibilities. As a parent, are you noticing that you're feeding yourself desserts 
uh, all day long. And if that's the case, how does that make your body feel? Do you notice that your body ends up craving specific nutrients? Are you craving more protein? Are you craving more color in your diet? Are you craving hydration? If, if not, I would encourage you to work with a registered dietitian to work on mindfulness and conscious eating. If you do notice that, then awesome. You actually have the insight and brain development and mindfulness to connect to your body and communicate your needs. Our children don't necessarily have that or they're working on building it, which is why we utilize the division or responsibilities. So as the parent really deciding on the what and the balance, and then the kid really gets to decide if and how much, and you may notice some days they want more of the carbohydrate and some days they want more of the color and some days they want more of the protein. And that's just them really figuring out their internalized connection to their cravings and needs and wants. Now, granted, Every single time I offer Henry a cookie, he's like, wow. It's like I literally just gave him the best present. But the coolest thing is, is because even though he gets excited and he has like the biggest smile on his face, it is a neutral food. I think he's just excited because he noticed that it tastes really good, but it's a neutral food. And so he'll sometimes eat as many as I give him, or other times he'll take a few bites and and stop. And it's the same thing with other foods. So again, keeping in mind division or responsibility. The other angle is recognizing that, and and we're not going to go into the science, but I have to hit on this. Sugar is carbs. Carbs are sugar. And our body is going to convert other nutrients into sugar. So if we're eating protein, Our body is going to convert that through a synthesis into sugar. So our body's main purpose is survival and to develop energy out of the food we eat. So most food is being converted down into its simplest form of sugar, which is glucose. But specifically to carbs, there's you know, long lasting carbs, short lasting carbs. And so when we have these parents of saying, well, I gave my kid a cookie or a juice box and they were bouncing off the walls, I'm like, wow, their body's so awesome. It did exactly what it was supposed to do with the food that you offered it, right? That you offered them. So the body is actually working exactly how it needs to be working. In what situations may that be really necessary? Well, let's think if you're running an endurance race and you need quick carb energy, you you better be eating quick digesting carbohydrates. I'm not going to yank out a chicken breast and broccoli with whole grain rice while I'm on this endurance race. That's going to take forever to digest. I'm going to eat chips and... uh, Whatever they have available, chews and goos and things along those lines. Uh, Someone that has diabetes and is dropping low, they're going to need quick energy to help raise up their blood sugar. Sugar is life-saving for a lot of individuals. So when we come and we demonize it, all that's telling me is that maybe we're lacking a little bit of awareness around how this nutrient really does save our bodies and really does serve a huge purpose in our bodies. So specifically for our kids, what I want to encourage you to focus on is more so the relationship that you're holding and the relationship that you're trying to have them develop, which hopefully is neutrality, where sometimes they can have cookies on their plate or dessert on their plate and they can turn away from it or take a bite and walk away. Or they could be at a birthday party and say, Mom, I don't really like the cake. Okay, you don't have to eat it, buddy. Right? Like, what a cool relationship. I love how you just described sugar as one of the main nutrients that our body needs instead of this like bad thing that's extra that diet culture uses to describe sugar. It's like, no, it's one of the main things that your body needs. Let's just call it what it is. It, it's part of your the nutrients that your body uses. So I like that you've kind of reframed that. Um, as, this, as a therapist, I love studying kind of the brain and the brain relationship with 
feeding and food relationship. And the reason why your son's face lights up when he sees the cookie is because the reward system of his brain is activated and working. Ooh. That the reward system holds all really positive associations with things. And so he has a positive association with that cookie. And it literally sends signals to that part of his brain that light it up, that have him go, ooh, that was positive. And so I'm going to remember that again. And sugar is one of the things that does go to the reward system of our brain, which is where the whole addiction thing takes off. But I that's how our brains light up. For example, if we ever... I don't know, went on a windy road and got super car sick. Every time we saw that road on a map, we'd like have a oh, reaction again, right? Because like our brains remembered that. But I love that his brain's working is the bottom line. And that's great. That's how it works. Um, that doesn't mean he's addicted to this cookie, right? Of being like, see, I shouldn't offer it because he's storage. so happy. And maybe sometimes he wants to eat a lot of them and sometimes... You know, we, we don't really think about the other times, right? We only think about the times where it causes us an emotional response, right? And and most often that's us projecting our own anxiety or fears or whatever onto our kids. But how what a cool awareness point to be like, he's smiling because it brings him joy. And like, yeah, last night him and I were eating Oreos after um, as a snack and dipping him in the milk and I was showing him how to put it on his fork and like let it rest in the milk and yes it tasted yummy but what a great quality time experience him and I are sharing and connection he told me I, I don't want any more and I was like okay I'm, I'm gonna eat I I'm do. gonna eat one more man <laughs> yeah. okay I yeah <laughs> The one thing I try to do practically too for the neutrality of all foods is just like we've talked about in the division of responsibility episodes, go back and find those. Um, I try to tell my children, again, they can choose the if they're going to eat it and how much with all foods. So this comes to desserts. So for example, if I'm out with my kids and we've gotten ice cream, like example yogurt land or menchies where you know they're just like cranking those things and they they don't know what they're portioning but that's part of the fun a big piece of what i will always say is like whenever your body is done we'll get the top and we'll bring it home and put it in the fridge and freezer now does it save that well not necessarily but it's gotten to the point where they know this food is neutral i can experiment with it i can eat it i can cap it my mom's not going to throw it away because this was some special occasion and she doesn't want me to have this again so i have so many Ziplocs of happy eaten ice cream cones and like half melted things that we'll go back and eat just as I would wrap up a leftover entree and have it as leftover. I thought you were going to say in your freezer you have like 17 bags of all these frozen. No. Okay. Well, no, no, no. It, but, but what I try to do is like whenever you want to stop on any of the foods, we can, we can save it for later. We can do what we want to do with it. And that gives the kids the ability then to be mindful with a sugar item because I think that's what a lot of parents fear in their children. Like if I give this to them, they'll never stop. So I have to stop them. Right. But I think if we give our kids opportunities to practice stopping and starting with all foods, they will develop that intuitive relationship with all foods. So I hear two different scenarios. One to the parent that's kind of just starting out and going, yes, I hear you. I'm happy to go down this road. Now, guess what, parents? You're going to sit on your hands. You're going to bite your tongue. You're going to let your kid get the stomach ache, right? And then they come and say, my belly hurts. Yeah, your belly hurts because, you know, your body's communicating to you that the last eating moment, maybe you had more than your belly wanted. And so this would be a good awareness next time. I, If you want, I can help you or you can remember this moment and uh, we can see how your belly communicates then, right? So we have to be able to provide these moments to our kids so that they can develop these skills. And remember, like Rachel is saying, have these brain responses and these emotional responses to, wow, I had a belly ache last time. Maybe I will be more mindful. And that can be with any food, right? Then we have these parents that are saying, I'm too far gone, right? Like my kid literally will not stop until they throw up like that. I've had so many parents come into session and say they literally eat these sweets to the point that their their body response is vomiting. They're not inducing vomiting, but their body response is vomiting. I hear you. So guess what? You might need some containment. 
and that's okay, right? So we can start off with the containment of, let's say we're going to go out and get ice cream. Like, buddy, what the size that we're all purchasing as a family is going to be a small size. Everyone in the family is doing it. You're not just shaming the one kid, right? Everyone in the family is purchasing the small size and you can say one to two toppings, right? Okay, fine. And if they ask why, you can say that's what our is in our family budget tonight, right? That's what that's what we're willing to spend on this food, okay? That's perfectly fine. Let's say you're at home and you're going to serve dessert with dinner. Well, whatever's on the table is you know, available for seconds. Well, if you want to provide some containment around the dessert, then only offer enough dessert for one serving per person. And then you can just say, well, there is no, there are no seconds tonight for dessert because that's not on the table. Well, what if the kid says, I saw some in the pantry? You're right, there is some more in the pantry, but I have plans for that for later in the week or for a lunch or for another time. And that's not what's being available today for this meal, right? It's okay to provide containment and structure. The one thing we want to avoid, and here comes this relationship piece, is creating this environment where now the kid feels like they need to hide it right and so they feel like it's not available to them they're extremely deprived from it and as a result they're going to get access to it they're going to sneak it and they're going to eat it in their room and then before you know it you're finding candy wrappers and all the stuff that's hidden in their room and to me what that tells me is the child needs more access to this food so if you want to provide the access with containment those are some a few scenarios and it would be having a conversation with the kid hey i I, i've been finding some candy wrappers in your room again we're not allowed to have food in the room and that's for sanitation reasons it has nothing to do with the exact food item it's no food all food none of it's allowed in your room But if you are wanting a snack or you have a preference for a particular snack that includes candy or dessert or whatever, just tell me and I'll make sure to include it into one of our meals or snacks. But remember, I'm in charge of the what, the when, and the where, and you get to decide if and how much. So I need your feedback. Do you want to be included more? But again, really trying to provide that access to the kids so that the relationship is healed for them. We really don't want these kids growing up, which I'm sure a lot of you parents are trying to unwind yourself, which is debunking all these myths and diet legacies that have been passed down that have been saying sugar and desserts and candies are bad when really we have access to them. And 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 we don't want our children to have to go through life scared that they ate three cookies beyond the serving size When really, who gives a crap? Like, it's okay. You're going to be okay. Well, I think the reason this is so hard, and parents are going to bring it to you now, is because you struggle with this. The biggest thing I hear from people is, if I keep these items in the house, I can't stop eating them. So clearly, I'm not an intuitive eater. And so I think this is really, really hard because parents really do struggle with their own cycle of deprivation and then maybe even binging or just enjoying and eating the foods. And they really don't have a neutral relationship with the foods themselves. So a lot of this work starts with you and your own neutralizing of desserts, sugar, whatever you want to call them, so that you can feel like you are recognizing when your body wants these foods and you're eating them and enjoying them in a way that you're mindful about your hunger and fullness. And then you're also putting them away and saying, okay, I'm moving on to other things my body might need. So having that relationship with food and with the sugar yourself is a great way to realize that there's nothing to fear about these foods. And then you're going to be able to have that energy with your kids in that way. I really see a lot of people come into session really just experiencing such shame around what they've eaten. And literally, we can work together for three, four, five years, really just talking about the shame that's wrapped up in these core beliefs that have been passed down or that have been based off of life experiences. And I really think that doing the deeper work of like, why am I creating so much shame around just a food? When really the beauty of it would be eating the food, forgetting about it, and moving on. We shouldn't really ever have this 
kind of relationship with a particular food item to where we're pre- preoccupied by it for days on end, or then shaming our body for craving it again, right? So I think the core of this all is really just trying to find that neutral space and doing the work there of like, I can eat a cookie and, and I'm going to be okay. And it's normal for my body to crave it. I think the second we tell ourselves to limit anything, not just food, I don't know, anything. Yeah. The second it becomes this power struggle. And I think sugar is the number one food the diet culture tells us to limit and to watch and to be careful of and all that jargon. And so it becomes this really overwhelming desire then because that reward system in our brain that says these are happy things why are you telling me to limit them and then we feel like this is just so confusing and overwhelming when really no one's ever said you really should limit your snap peas and therefore we just can't stop craving snap peas it's like no and and so it's really really about the mind and how we view these foods that really makes it I think so complicated when it gets to the point where you have gotten to that healed relationship with food and you get do feel like you are mindful and intuitive, you'll notice that there is really a natural rhythm to the foods that you're eating and the foods that you're thinking about and the foods that you're craving and that your reward system is excited about certain foods still because it, it has certain ingredients and elements and that that's okay, that is what it is. I was talking to a friend who lost her sense of taste and smell for an extended period of time because of COVID. And she was saying how, you know, the whole diet culture jargon around all that is like, oh, maybe you'll eat so much healthier now since you can't taste anything. And she was kind of saying, guess what? Even though I can't taste it, my body still tells me when it wants sugar. It t- still tells me when it wants dessert. Even though I can't taste it, total bummer, but my body still sends the cravings. And to Tina's example, your body still is going to use this as energy. And so therefore, it's still sending the cravings. So I was curious what you think about that from the nutrition lens. I mean, look, our our body needs carbohydrates to survive. So it, it it's not like, hey, you only need carbohydrates as long as you can smell and taste them. <laughs> This is biology here, right? You need carbohydrates, aka sugar, to that's the easiest energy. And so your friend or whoever is, their body is healing. Their body is going through a sickness. And so what nutrient do they need the most of? Carbohydrates. So I'm not surprised. Well, this is even after it's been a couple months. COVID's, COVID's over, but this is But their, their body effect. is still healing from that, right? So right, their body right, is, true, true. you know, going through nutrition rehabilitation and healing. And so uh, it, it really doesn't surprise me that they would be craving those carbohydrates. And their brain, just like you said before, remembers these moments and it's like, ah, I, I, I'm craving that moment. I, I, I want that taste. I want that sensation. I want my body to feel that way. And so as a result, they're sending out those signals, whether or not they can taste, smell or whatever it. I feel like before we close up, I always have to mention the access to privilege. And so I think while we're, you know, when we can kind of think from this angle, um, or if you're thinking from this binary angle that like sugar is bad, this is good, we're forgetting about access. We're forgetting about those individuals that are really don't have access to foods that are considered uh, nutrient rich or are working uh, multiple jobs just to provide food on the table. And guess what? The cheaper things are foods that have added sugars in them and or are packaged foods. And so we need to recognize that health and what is um, healthy for our body and our brain is so much more beyond uh, the food. And so we are definitely going to be tapping into that concept um, a little bit later in this season in an episode. So I just want to throw that out there that if you're coming to the angle of, you know, sugar is bad, I'm going to restrict it. Like, 
hey, guess what? You actually have that privilege to be able to offer that option. And is that really, is that privilege really the best use of that access? Or is the better access to be able, or the better privilege, be able to offer uh, awareness to your child and neutrality with your child around this food? Um, and, you know, so they can develop a better relationship with food and ultimately be more aware that other uh, families and children don't actually have access to the things that you consistently have access to and have choice around. So just throwing that little nugget in there. Yeah, I think my closing thought is that I really hope that parents can do the work to learn how to enjoy the dessert, portion the dessert, mindfully eat the dessert right alongside their children because that is something that the whole family can enjoy as a, as a taste and as a memory, and as a connection. And that is also the best way to develop, to help your child develop that neutral relationship too by doing the role modeling. So every member of the family can have a great peaceful relationship with it, but parents, please start with you. All right, y'all. Well, we will catch you next week. Thanks for listening to this episode. Follow us on social media at, at Mom Jeans, the podcast. See you later. Bye. That's a wrap on this episode of the Bite Size Education Series. And we hope this new information provides you with a more critical lens when you hear mainstream diet culture messaging. You can connect with us on social media, on Instagram, at Mom Jeans, the podcast. And feel free to email your own listener questions to momjeansthepodcast at gmail.com. If you loved the episode, please leave us a rating and review on iTunes and recommend the episode to a friend. Sending you the inner strength to accept your jeans with a G and wear the jeans with a J. Bye. This episode of Mom Jeans was produced and edited by Rachel Coleman and Tina LaBoy. Just a reminder, this episode is not a substitute for therapeutic counsel or nutrition advice. Thank you to Jerry DePizzo for the music production. You can find episode information and show notes at www.momjeansthepodcast.com. Follow us on Instagram at momjeansthepodcast and join the Mom Jeans the Podcast Facebook group to find a community of mamas learning to love their bodies and discussing the episodes. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Mom. See you next time.